Hi everyone, great to be here. If you can switch to my screen. Um, raise your hand if you know where this uh, screenshot is taken from. If you don't, I recommend to Google it. It's a great source. Um, yeah. So basically, nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. This is like kind of my uh, key takeaway from uh, my talk today. But yet they come. And that's actually super important. And actually, the formal title of my talk uh, uh, until we changed it today was Past, Present, and Future of Gen AI, not just the future. Actually, most of it would be on the past and the present. But actually, it's about disruption and also kind of past, present, and future. I experienced disruption very much in the last year. Um, I am actually, uh, I think the industry is experiencing disruption as we speak, and I think as product managers, I'll talk a little bit about the end. I think we're going to experience a very big disruption uh, afterwards. Um, so I think it's a worthwhile topic. But let's uh, go into it. Gen AI, past, present, and future. And the easy part is, of course, the past. So I spent the last decade working on Gen AI and conversational AI. So almost 10 years ago, I was among the three founders of the Google Assistant. And also later on, we started Google Lens. And I spent about seven years over there. And three years ago, I moved to lead the conversational AI and Gen AI in Google Cloud. So really, uh, 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 spent a lot of time on it. And here I just want to share uh, kind of our dreams and our journey and how, you know, we moved up with technology. But the key takeaway is the Spanish Inquisition. Yet it comes, you know, 10 years deep into it, I was a bit surprised. And when we started, we were inspired mostly by the fast progress of machines' ability to communicate and understand as humans. It was mostly about senses. Um, it was about, you know, machines were starting to see better than humans. A, a machine were actually understanding what humans are saying better than humans could understand. Machines were speaking actually better than humans. Let me sound, you know. So this is a demo. One is a machine, a bot speaking, and the other one is an actor. Let's see if you know which is which. She earned a doctorate in sociology at Columbia University. She earned a doctorate in sociology at Columbia University. Right? You know, I, we ourselves don't know which is which, to be honest. And then machines actually could uh, start showing emotion based on content. And this, you know, disclaimer, this is kind of from cloud. So the content is not really exciting and not really sad, but. The Pixel Fix is a great upgrade. You can get it for only $90 per month. And then the disaster. Unfortunately, we can't give you any more discounts. So really, I like, and again, so we were saying, oh, wow, they can communicate, you know, and we had this amazing vision of, wow, we're going to this new world and we're shifting from a real world when we humans had to learn how to interact with machines, you know. You know, as a young, my first job was to teach all people in the government, all is now my age, all people in the government how to use mouse and windows and stuff, right? It was very frustrating to a world where machines are learning how to communicate, like ask, listen, speak, watch, point, right? That was like, that was the dream, basically. And we know that natural language understanding is the big barriers. Like, you know, that wasn't there because when I started 10 years ago, actually, it was super basic. There was no machine learning. There were actually people with PhD in linguistics that kind of wrote grammars in weird syntax, trying to imagine all the ways a person is going to say something and kind of like regular expressions try to match it. But very quickly, year after year, we saw progress. And this is what kind of created the excitement. You know, in 2013, we started to understand the meaning of words and then the meaning of sentences and then the meaning of paragraphs. But it all was a bit, uh, in order to train these things, you needed a lot of data. It was all very manual. And then in 2017, there was this paradigm shift to large language models, right? Suddenly, we saw these like giant models that could use a lot of data that completely uh, uh, went to a total new way of understanding. But in order to do that, we needed to do two big breakthroughs. And this is a little bit about the history of NLU, but also, again, in the back of your mind, okay, so since 2017, we are deep into large language models. We know them, we understand them, we're solving problems related, and yet they come. So in 2017, we solved the first problem of hardware. How can you train something so big with so much data in a way that is actually efficient and makes use of parallel computing. Before that, you couldn't do it. It was too expensive, too slow. 
The second breakthrough, the big one, was actually in 2018 when we actually found how can you train it? How can you teach it with so much data? So in order to explain how we did that, let me take one of the hardest problems in science is how do you recognize a cat? This kind of illustrates how the technology was evolved. So if you were a developer that was required to build an app that recognized a cat 20 years ago, you would need to use a rule system or an expert system. That means you would define all the characteristics of a cat. So a cat is this high, it has this fur, it has this tail, little pointy triangular ears, it has a mustache. If you were lucky and you could, you could also say it does meow and it moves like this and that, right? So you would write all of these, you know, kind of complex rules. You will launch your app. The first user takes a photo of a cat. The, the tail is behind the sofa. It fails to recognize. Right, you know, there isn't enough lightning. It looks like one instead of two, or the cat is jumping, or you don't see its head or whatever, you know. So what you would do, you would add more and more and more rules. So you would have a more and more complex system that is still very, very brittle. Then in 2013, the big breakthrough in machine learning came and we said, huh, that's not how we learn how to identify a cat. No kid is taught four legs, a tail, and all of these details and rules. What we do, is we actually show them a lot of pictures, kind of cat, cat, dog, cat, cat, dog, cat, cat, dog. After enough example, the kids has a mental mind, right? No explicit rule, kind of implicit rule that they build themselves. And when you show them a photo of a cat, even if it's not exactly what they think, they're capable of generalizing, even if the lighting is wrong or a different angle, right? So this is actually what machine learning did at the beginning. We were using data, we were using examples, and that's how we thought, whether it is to recognize a cat or to say whether a review is good or bad, or whether to say whether an X-ray is of a cancer or not, or whether to translate between languages, we just provided examples. And this is amazing and it's much more accurate, it's not as brittle, it's more flexible, generalizing, but someone needs to create the examples. Humans need to create these labeled examples. And when you think about X-ray of recognizing where whether a breast, breast cancer is benign or not, you actually need some expert people, right? So this is slow, this is expensive. And moreover, every time you create such a model, it is good for one specific task for which you had this training set. So if you do a Q&A on health and you want now to do Q&A of a, a, on, on legal sorts, you need a whole new data set with completely different expertise and train again the model. And then with large language models, we came with this idea, can we actually create foundational knowledge? Instead of training you to know one thing, let's teach you about language, about the, the, land, the world in general, by just letting you read all the information out, the book, subscript, you know, stuff that we're recording, anything digital out there, high quality, there's a bunch of junk that you shouldn't learn from, but just learn that and then you will kind of be able to do that. But then comes the question, how can you actually teach kind of, you know, kind of a chicken and egg thing? And how do you do that with the problem that data sets, how do you, will you get the labels? How will you explain? And the answer was ridiculously simple. Fill mm -mm blanks. So actually, if you think about it, if you have a lot of text and you just delete stuff from it, the answer already exists and machine learning knows how to learn where the real answer, ground truth exists. So you don't need to create any labels. The labels are within. And this is a very efficient way now to take all the things and just delete certain things. And if you think about it, to do it properly and consistently in a good way, which is what we did with these models, it's not trivial, right? When you look at that, Jack went, okay, could be very many things. Jack was very unhappy, Jack went, okay. It started to focus on me. All right, Jack just watched his team, the flyer, lose the championship to the range. Jack was very, okay. So actually, right, and then it's like, you know, through prepared, and Jack is actually a racing horse. That completely changes, but that shows actually the importance of having when you have a lot of data and a big enough brain to store enough information and to have a complex enough representation, you can actually gain deep understanding of things in order to guess that correctly, right? So actually they learn from context. They learn a much more thing. And when you think about it, you can actually learn languages, right? If you're good at filling in banks, you can easily learn languages. You can learn about the world. You can learn about causality, right? Like this is a very simple, hardly any context, just a simple exposure to sunlight causes, you know, skin cancer. Exposure to sunlight causes, mm, 
mm, causes right. If you learn how to do that properly, you learn deep things about the world that A causes B, the relationship between specific things, right? So you actually become very intelligent at this very, very simple task that is very, very easy to do in parallel. There is a ton of code examples on the web. Do it with code examples, you learn how to code in all languages. There is even Shakespeare on the web. Right? So again, you learn how, you know, what Shakespeare is. You learn how to create poems. You learn how to create everything. So this is actually a very simple, very generic. And this is actually how large models are trained. And the cool thing I said large models, because this is not limited to language. You can actually take an image, delete some of it, and require the model to complete it. Again, you have the real answer. And if you think about it, when you get that thing, for example, the bus, you need to understand that bus has this shape, that they have windows, right? In order to really guess that this is actually bus from that limited thing. So again, you learn about the different representations of different things, visual, language. You can do the same with audio. You can do the same with music. You can do the same with voice. Anything that you have a collection that you can delete parts of it and then ask the model to recreate it actually creates deep semantic understanding for that specific modality. This is just a cool example of what you can do with it, right? Okay, Very famous so painting. We give it to a model and it's starting to complete it. And that's, that's a key point. The model doesn't remember. It really understands kind of concepts in the world that there is continuity in style and content, that certain things make sense in certain places. It's a semantic representation that then the model knows how to create something from it. It's not just some statistical, simple uh, 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 thing. Very cool uh, 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 capability. And of course, once you understand language and you understand images or you understand any other modality in a semantic way, you can connect. So you can actually tell the model, create some a cartoon, you know, based on some description, it says, oh, I know what that means. Then there is some semantic representation. It says, I know how to represent that in an in a, 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 a image representation. And then I know how to create the image. And then you can actually start creating images or videos or sounds based on descriptions, book covers, you know, and we have a lot of examples, but not enough time to cover all of that. And then we realize that there is one special flavor of filling the blanks. And this is kind of guess the next word. So instead of filling the word in the middle of the sentence, you're actually guessing the next. And of course, there is the entire context of the horse or whatever it is, you know, eh, 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 that came before, right? So it's not just my, there was some context before. And this is the same game. You're just trying to guess what is the next word. And that's a special flavor because when you think about it, the beginning could be an instruction. So if I tell the model, translate a paragraph from English to Spanish and I give now a sentence, the most reasonable way it would give actually to give the translation in Spanish, write a code snippet to do something, right? So actually just by guessing the next word and the, if the model really understands well, like we have trained it, it can actually start doing any instruction. So that ability to fill in the blanks is actually also an ability to fill in instruction. You can take filling instruction and just reduce it to guessing the next word. And with a little bit of tuning and then buzzwords like RLHF and other stuff, it can actually get very good at it. And when you think about it, you can actually also do stuff that are considered creative, right? So this is something I did this morning, write a poem about a group of, group of product managers who come together to Zurich to learn about AI. And just read it for a second, like this is super creative in a way. And again, all he did is to learn how to continue from that, but it knows what a poem is, it understands the presentation of the ass. And I bet that if we did a competition, I don't think it would be among the last here in the room. So this is actually very impressive. And this is what we were surprised to see. We were surprised how good this thing can be suddenly in doing this kind of very generative task. And this is me kind of looking at OpenAI announcing about ChatGPT. And, and all the images, by the way, I created on, uh, also with AI, most of the images in the, in the deck, uh, using description. Um, and, and what happened, that thing was actually two storms that became the perfect storm. One was this new ability of a model to follow instructions, to generate, to kind of continue the next word in a way that is super useful, that was still imperfect, was, but was transformational. You know, people found ways to do things that they couldn't do before, right? Like, you know, someone makes your homework. But, you know, there's also other stuff. 
The second thing that happened, the interface did not require any expertise. You just asked for it. And it doesn't need to be tied. It just happened that the way that we told it was like, you know, natural language. So that combination allowed to take that transformational ability and not put it in the hand of 10,000 developers, but hundreds of millions of users. And they actually then showed to everyone and to everyone that was in the field that this is actually a, you know, gazillion, billion, trillion more capable than we thought. And capable is not the opposite of perfect or imperfect. The thing definitely has a ton of issues, but it's actually a super useful a, a, a technology. And the funny thing, you know, I was surprised, admittedly. I wasn't the only one. I like, you know, <laughs> some other ones saying, we did not expect that. So, so how does fundamental disruption feel like? And this is fundamental disruption. And again, you know, thank you AI for, uh, you know, illustrating the feelings. So, I think the key thing is, is like, you know, kind of the ground goes underneath your legs because you have like kind of fundamental assumptions that either completely evaporate or are thinned down without something to replace them. And there isn't yet something to replace because to have fundamentals of, you know, what is possible, what's the theory behind it, what's hard, what's easy, how long does something take? Like over the last year, you know, Thoughts, things that we thought that are like, you know, super hard and unsolvable two, three months now are now like kind of so, you know, on all open source and everything. Stuff that, you know, that is hard today might be easy, you know, right? So people are starting company based on something and then, oh, actually it's commoditized. And what we're seeing as a result is that this is like, you know, this huge competition between the large providers, you know, Google, Microsoft and others, right? So they're one, very bold in launching stuff, but also bold in announcing stuff. That isn't it yet launched, right? So it's like, you know, again, it's actually amplified because the speed is amplifying. It's actually what really works and what's not. And then you have these customers that, that are seeing all of that. They have unrealistic expectations. Everyone has this kind of budget for AI transformation because they have this FOBO, fear of being obsolete. It's the new buzzword, right? And then very smart entrepreneurs are coming and say, oh, let me do that. They're implementing something that seems hard, but it's actually easy. This entrepreneur now has this brand because this brand has a billion dollars to spend on that. He goes to an investor and said, oh, I'm with this very famous bank. I'm going to be a unicorn. No, you're not. You're going to be irrelevant. But that creates a bubble now, right? Because you're investing in stuff that doesn't have any foundations. And then, you know, they have this analyst and press that they want to write about it, but they have no idea because things are moving so fast. So they are kind of drinking from the Kool-Aid and whatever we feed them, adding fuel to the fire, creating the pressure. And everything is just nuts, right? Like, you know, we have like, you know, these German banks that are doing things in production, cars that are putting things in stuff without no one really knowing, you know, how does it work and how are we going to solve the problems? So that was last year. The present moment is a little bit better. So I think like, Clearly, AI is the third big shift. You know, we had internet, we had mobile, and clearly AI is anything in the sense this is not hype, this is real, and it's real because, you know, we've been working on it for 10 years. The thing is not just happened last year. Yeah, it blew up because of what I said, but we are, you know, it's integrated in products that are used by billions. We know how to do it kind of effectively. Yeah, it's not perfect, but it will get there. And when you think about, you know, internet and mobile, it completely changed the world. You know, the, the things we're doing, the company that are now the biggest one in the stock market, the way we interact with each other, the way we're doing business did not exist before. That is completely changed. Any company that said, mm, internet is not a thing, mobile is not, thing, not with us anymore. AI is the same thing, but much, much bigger and more fundamental. This is kind of, you know, the... <laughs> and it's moving now, you know, yeah, everyone knows ChatGPT, some people know Bard. Um, but actually, it's moving also now to businesses. And we all know, you know, the, the, the chatbots that we all hated. You know, they were like kind of, you know, limited. You only could chat with them, ping pong, ping pong. You know, they had very limited intelligence, kind of hard-coded stuff. They had very limited capabilities, mostly answering, and maybe little cards that were frustrating. They weren't integrated. They were completely on the side of some web page, and there was zero personalization. 2023 has been exceptionally good for chatbots and these kind of conversational experiences. And again, this allows businesses, right? This is the ecosystem. This takes away from, you know, one, two companies, but actually creates this paradigm shift for businesses, right? So now you have bots that, you know, multimodal input and output. I'll show you a demo just in a second. 
you know, definitely human language and human level understanding. They can actually generate things. It become much more useful. They are actually contextual to what's going on. We are actually putting them in the products that you use most. Docs, email, calendar, you have this duet or copilot thing. And of course, they're deeply personalized. And let me just show you a demo of how it feels now. This is actually a conversational bot that we built based on current experiences that actually scales personal retailing to this new kind of experience. So this is still, you know, kind of the present. It's still early. It's still, up, but I think it's already allowing pay, a, a, a businesses to the, get to the next level of experiences, higher conversions, and, and and so forth. And it's really transforming every industry. So again, you know, your industry is going to be disrupted. I've spoken over the last year. I think with all Fortune 500 companies. Everyone is doing something and they are doing it across all departments. There is a very clear path to where you start this duet or copilot where a human is using the bot, whether to create documents, summarize documents, to answer questions, to create catalogs, to create marketing materials, to create training materials. Right. So this is very safe. You're not delegating yet to an AI, but you are becoming so much more efficient. You are creating higher quality content 10x faster. This is already happening in the next phase of things is already in the oven. And companies are figuring out how actually to bring this technology to enterprise and developers, right? So yeah, LLMs are great in feeling human problem solvers. You can build a prototype in a second, but you know, you have all of these real world problems of an enterprise, you know, data privacy and compliance. How do you make sure that it's factual, that it doesn't hallucinate? How do you make sure that you know that you integrate a, 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 your backend systems? Because at the end, I need to connect it to my ordering system, to my account system, to my CRM to be really useful. You know, how do I debug, improve, and fix? How do I ground it in my own data so it doesn't hallucinate and answer a generic? But if someone asks about a product, a price, or a policy, it's actually mine. Right? So all of these are real world problems. And all of these are actually being worked on. And I wouldn't say solved, but are good enough actually to deploy some of these into the enterprise. So this is actually be a, 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 a real. So really, I think like, you know, my key point of the, the present is enterprise and consumer is being disrupted by this technology. It's going to change. It's going to change everything. Not necessarily replace immediately, not necessarily automate out completely, but definitely it's a new technology that is real, that is mature and maturing and changing the way things that are. So let's talk about the future. And I think the key word here is, of course, always in parentheses. I don't know the future, I admit. Um, and I want to focus mostly about, you know, the future for us uh, uh, product managers. And the easiest way to, to, to look at the future is to look actually at the past. And I spoke, you know, you know, that this actually is the third. So let's remember a little what happened with the previous two paradigm shifts, you know, web and mobile. So from a product perspective, everything's changed, right? So, so you know, consumer and social categories did not exist. 
I still, you know, like back in the 80s and early 90s, consumer was video games. That's it. Not, nothing beyond that. Before the internet that didn't exist, you know, social didn't exist, you know, even later. If you think about kind of the habits, the verbs that we're doing today, I am post, like, share, check in, tweet, Facebook, did not exist. Web and mobile UX, you know, personal, personalization, discovery, identity, monetization, all of these things that are the bread and butter of products and product management did not exist and completely change by these two that are actually smaller a, 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 a transformation. If you think about product management as a profession, well, actually product management hardly existed before that actually the consumer world created product management as it is today. But agile development is opposed to just because, you know, the web works very differently than how software is developed. Completely changed, you know, the way we do product quality, A-B experiments, evals, the stuff that we mentioned, the scale and the things, you know, retention quality, the expertise that we have, the type of product manager, right? You know, all of this completely changed, right? So if you think about it and say, okay, so how does AI change it? I think that that actually raises some question. And I want to, uh, uh, before I give you my uh, uh, one slide on it, I want to show you another product um, that is all based on current capabilities. Um, but what you will see here is two things I want you to see. So this is actually, for marketing department, and it allows you, how can you actually do product innovation? In this case, it's kind of a sunscreen product. It's not a software product, but you can actually see how in this kind of duet mode, you can brainstorm and generate product ideas and artifacts with AI. And have two, th two things I want to say. First, what we're seeing is we're moving from the world where the chatbot is on the side of the regular UI to a world where it's actually conversational and generative first, but immersive. It takes the entire screen. The UX elements are actually generative and conversational. The second thing that have in the back of your mind, huh, that person is working with a machine to do product management. So let's watch it. And it's all current capabilities, just like very nicely integrated together. <laughs> Thank you.
So there was no black magic here or delegating to robot. It was really a human and machine collaborating together what the human is good at, what the machine is good at. I think where humans are a bit stuck, the machines are actually making progress quickly. That's at least my observation. Um, so yeah, let me share with you my broken foggy crystal ball a little bit, yeah. So, so, so I think two things in my opinion are happening. One, I think there is a new product paradigm. Today, we, we as product managers are trying to guess what the user will find most useful, most helpful, most productive in terms of UI, in terms of recommendation, in terms of content. Right? So we're kind of pre-populating that thing. I think we're going, because of the generative capabilities, we're going to kind of switch to this hyper-personalized, hyper-contextual, like almost kind of a you know blank canvas that means the user would say, show me this, show me that. No, translate it, explain to me, right? So the user will kind of be their own product manager with mostly data behind it. So I think like, you know, so, so you know, one question, okay, so in that world, what is the role of product manager, you know? And of course, you know, behind the scenes, you can measure everything and, you know, kind of do automated hill climbing. You can do A-B experiments, or right? So a lot of things can actually be automated. The second thing is really, I feel that there is democratization and automation of a lot of the PM work and PM skills. When I'm thinking a lot of the stuff that we're currently doing, you know, requirement collection, definitely can be scared and automated, generating the questionnaire, sending them out, analyzing, right? Generating ideas, prototypes and mocks to scale. We've seen that, right? Generate 20 ideas, 30 ideas. And what we have seen also that it doesn't go to the model. What the models do now, we combine models with search. We can upload whatever sources and tell the model, use your own understanding only to understand what I want to do, but focus on this content for the content, right? So if there is no problem in hallucination or, or non-updated. You can feed it with questionnaires. You can feed it with user input. You can feed it with what you want, actually. The same thing that you as a PM would use. Collecting and crunching data, you know, that clearly they a better summarizing and driving insights. You know, we're already seeing that. Suggesting changes, right? So I think a lot of these things, either machines can do almost automatically or someone that maybe isn't a PM, can actually also do. And again, when we're thinking that, you know, I didn't touch it, but one of the first uh, uh, roles to be automated to or semi-automated is code writing, right? So maybe, you know, you need much less skills in order to create an app and actually write the code. Um, so I don't think, you know, I'm not saying, you know, hey, let's close the, uh, 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 the summit, you know, uh, uh, after my talk. Um, but um, I think there is still, you know, it's not the end. But what I am suggesting, you know, Expect the Spanish Inquisition. They are here. They are looking for you. And really, jump. It's not a train. It's really a roller coaster. Admittedly, we, we need to learn and unlearn, and we'll make a lot of mistakes. But I think that being part of it and joining early is the best thing that you can do. Like, enjoy the curse of living in exciting times. Thank you. <laughs>